Welcome back to the Vandy Sports Podcast. I'm Joey Dwyer here at Bridgestone Arena for the final time after Vanderbilt's 87 to 75 loss at the hands of Texas A&M. Turns out the only cure to magic is dead legs, and Vanderbilt certainly felt that today. It felt like in the early minutes when Vanderbilt trailed by up to 27 to nine, and Texas A&M we had a 7-0 run to start the game. That dead legs and running out of gas were certainly words that were going to come up a lot today. And even from the first possession when Tyron Lawrence missed that wide open three short, it kind of felt like, wow, this might be an issue. And I didn't know if it would be. Obviously, it's normal for that to be an issue. But with this team, you just never know if anything like that's going to pop up. But today it did. And uh, early on, it was pretty, pretty apparent because you notice early on where guys like Ezra Mignon, who hasn't turned it over a whole lot throughout the season, looks a little looks a little flustered and uh, this team just looked a little sluggish coming out of the gate guys who don't miss open shots were missing them short and uh, guys who don't turn the ball over were making costly mistakes Vanderbilt had two Vanderbilt had two uh, early shot clock violations and seven turnovers before the second media timeout that about decided this one this game was out of hand as soon as it got to 27-9 Studi hit a three to kind of answer back but from that point with dead legs playing behind is not what you want to do and especially against a veteran-led team like Texas a and They're not going to blow a lead like that. Vanderbilt did fight its way back into this game, but ultimately from about the 14-minute mark in the first half, it felt like this one was going to be Texas a and and it felt like Vanderbilt maybe had some life at some points in the second half, had a nice 21-6 run, got the crowd into it. Uh, a lot of this crowd was Vanderbilt heavy. Just wasn't enough today, and uh, I think Vanderbilt's margin for error it was a little bit smaller without Liam Robbins, obviously, but I think it was a little too small to play three games in a row, and we saw that today um, with the big three that Vanderbilt had kind of established throughout the last two or three weeks when it's playing its best basketball. It was Ezra Mignon, it was Tyron Lawrence, it was Jordan Wright. They were just trying to get anything out of anybody else. Colin Smith gave him some good minutes today, had one of his better games at Vanderbilt. Um, some other guys like Paul Lewis gave him some good minutes at some points throughout the last couple weeks. Um, Miles Studi did some good things, but not – not really the last two games, but um, Vanderbilt just needed more from anyone other than the big three. And uh, with Liam Robbins, they got that. Margin of error was a lot smaller, though, when those guys didn't have great games. Ezra Mignon looked maybe a step slow. Tyron Lawrence was really quiet early. Vanderbilt really had no answer for anything uh, Texas a was trying to do, and that's a veteran-led team, a team that's going to out-rebound you. So you got to beat it with your guard play, and Vanderbilt couldn't do that today. Now Vanderbilt has... Uh, <laughs> Not much to control. Vanderbilt's in the eyes of the committee, and uh, now we wait. Vanderbilt is right on the bubble. I don't think this would be a discussion if they weren't so close to the bubble. When you look at Joe Lenardi's bracketology this morning, Vanderbilt was the fourth team out. I'd probably have him closer to the second team out at that point, but what I think doesn't matter. It's all the committee now. Whatever Joe Lenardi think doesn't matter now. It's on the committee. Uh, the public perception doesn't really matter anymore. These guys are going to evaluate how they want to evaluate. They're gonna see what they want to see. And uh, I'm afraid for Vanderbilt that what they see might not be what they want to see. they want them to see. Vanderbilt had has a fine resume, has 10 wins between quad one and quad two. Now 10 and 11 between the top two quads, has some nice wins, has been playing its best basketball lately. But did it do enough? I don't know. Uh, we talked a lot about that throughout the week. Just the entire body of work maybe isn't on par with some teams like maybe Wisconsin, maybe an Arizona State, a Pitt just really hard to see uh, at some points how Vanderbilt gets in. And I go back and forth at some points, I think, how can you leave this team out? And then at other times, I think, man, there's no way they're gonna put this team in. And uh, despite Vanderbilt playing really good basketball lately and just having this special run, I wrote about how special this run really was. Vanderbilt hadn't even got to Saturday of the SEC tournament since 2015. Just kind of shows where this program is and kind of the run it's been on this week. But. Will it be short? Who knows? <laughs> it's, it's really hard for me to analyze because we're analyzing what other people think. And uh, we, have, we have some metrics that will tell us kind of what they're thinking. We have some context clues, but ultimately it's up to them. And uh, now Vanderbilt has put itself in a position where it has to wait on them. And I know it's killing them. I talked to Jordan right after the game and it's just, man, uh, it's gotta be tough. And these are probably gonna be the longest 24 hours of Jerry Stackhouse's life. His program could legitimately be altered by what happens in the next 24 hour, hours. You make the tournament, that's a lot of recruiting momentum. That's a lot of public or, um, public perception points for your program. You don't make the tournament, you're playing the NIT two years in a row. 
It's a lot different. And uh, Vanderbilt has a lot to gain in the next 24 hours. Uh, maybe not as much to lose because we didn't think this team would be in the tournament anyway. But the season's not a success uh, fully if they don't make the tournament. We always thought that the expectation this year had to be to make the tournament. And obviously Vanderbilt had that magical run in the second half that uh, really just emphasized everything and talked and uh, really showed us how good this team could be, showed us the culture of this team. There were so many special nights throughout the second half of the season. What an incredible team to cover throughout that stretch. Jerry Stackhouse hadn't beaten four teams in the SEC. He beat Tennessee, he beat Kentucky twice, beat Florida, beat um, Auburn. And Memorial Magic was back. Just an incredible run for Vanderbilt, and I don't think tonight should be something that takes away from that. Uh, Memorial Magic was back. Memorial Gymnasium was the place to be in Nashville for a while there. And uh, I don't think you can take that away from Vanderbilt, obviously. That looks better if they make the tournament, but uh, I think we can't forget how special this run was just because of Vanderbilt laying an egg today and coming out flat. Uh, just a really special second half for Vanderbilt, but ultimately fell short today and may fall short of the tournament tomorrow. Vanderbilt still has a fighting chance though. And uh, three months ago, I wouldn't have thought we would have given any thought to Selection Sunday. Now there'll be a rapid reaction show tomorrow, analyzing whether Vanderbilt gets in, Vanderbilt doesn't get in, what their draw will be. Vanderbilt's gonna be playing meaningful postseason games and uh, really special uh, what they did the second half. Obviously the first half didn't go well and I think the whole body of work does need to be accounted for, but man, this team was really gonna be heartbroken and if they don't make the tournament and they certainly have good reason to. This team's been right on the outskirts of the bubble. It's on the bubble today, it's right there with a win. Probably half the committee's gonna wanna put you in half is not and it's going to come up to some hard decisions now Vanderbilt leaves uh, a little bit too much room uh, for them to make a decision and Vanderbilt didn't do quite enough couldn't get to the SEC championship and uh, couldn't get that auto bid now you leave it in the committee's hands and uh, Jerry Stackhouse said in the presser that he thinks Vanderbilt's done more than enough to get in but do we know if the committee thinks the same way who knows what do they think of Vanderbilt's two quad three losses? What do we think of their quad four loss? What does the committee think of their 10 quad one wins as opposed to those? What does the committee think of Vanderbilt doing a little bit better at home than it did on the road? It's just so much, uh, so much up for debate. How do they think about the strength of schedule? How do they think about the computer metrics? There's just so much going on uh, in terms of Vanderbilt's resume. It's one of the more complicated resumes this year just because of how well they've played lately and how poorly they played early on but Vanderbilt is right there and this one is going to absolutely kill Vanderbilt if they can't get in the tournament just a really brutal loss um, but I don't think you could have asked for much better of a stretch from this team even that it came down to today uh, was really impressive to be honest with you Vanderbilt couldn't quite get the job done against the veteran team but they're the number two seed in the league for a reason uh, they can rebound they have athleticism they pressure you a little bit and uh, Vanderbilt, I don't think, was quite ready for that. Uh, flat legs, just a really, really tough night for Vanderbilt um, and a really tough next 24 hours it'll, as it'll have to wait for the selection show to see if its name will be called. Um, I don't know if I want to make a guess on what's going to happen there, but it's certainly going to be tough. And it's certainly going to have to take a committee member banging on the table for Vanderbilt saying, Look at what they've done the last few weeks. Look at the basketball it's played. Look at the quad and one and two wins. Vanderbilt's got five. It's picked up two or three in the last couple weeks. There's a little bit left to be desired on that resume, but Vanderbilt certainly has a case. And uh, Jerry Stackhouse certainly thinks they do as well. But again, Vanderbilt didn't do enough today uh, to help its resume. They didn't get the auto bid, but um, just being in this position, playing on a Saturday at the SEC tournament, a step for this program it hasn't done that since 2015 uh, it was really close last year um, but man what what the next 24 hours this is going to be Vanderbilt is going to be right there and uh, we'll keep you updated with coverage throughout that but I really want to thank you guys for all the support this year this might be my last game covered in person unless they make the tournament and it's within driving distance of Nashville or Georgia or uh, whether it's an NIT game in Nashville that I'm back at school for. I'm on spring break this week, won't be able to cover an NIT game until what would it be Sunday. So I uh, just want to thank you guys all for uh, 
this opportunity. Thank you, Chris, obviously. Uh, just a blessing to be here. I was here as a fan last year with my dad watching all these games and uh, to be on press row right there. Um, to be sitting in those seats for these kind of games with people caring about what I have to say and uh, me being allowed to stay late and talk to people like Jerry Stackhouse, see people like John Calipari, uh, see all the ESPN people like Carl Ravage, Marty Smith, have conversations with them. Just a blessing and uh, something I thank God for every day. So I really appreciate you guys this year. And uh, man, what a tough outing for Vanderbilt, uh, but what an incredible week for the Commodores as they played in a stage that I hadn't played in in a while. Um, just a really solid week. And that game against Kentucky is something I think a lot of Vanderbilt fans will never forget. So. Uh, I appreciate you guys again, and uh, we'll have you guys updated with more coverage throughout the next few weeks. What I would preface to you as we head into Selection Sunday, might be disappointing what happens tomorrow, might be thrilling. Don't forget the run this team went on. Don't forget the magic that this team possessed. That doesn't come around all that often, and I would rarely ever say I'm not going to bet against this team when they're facing a punch back from Kentucky. Just. This team had something special. This team had and might still have the it factor more than any team I've seen in recent memory, even today, finding a way to make a run in that second half back at Texas A&M and punch back, uh, even with flat legs, even with playing its third game in three days. Vanderbilt found a way back into this game and got the crowd behind it. And it's really been a team that the crowd has gravitated towards throughout the year. And uh, it didn't seem that way for a while. So just think about that in perspective, obviously, Jerry Sackhouse uh, put, his, uh, put too many expectations on himself early in the year for us to be completely happy with what we saw uh, throughout the season. He said early in the year they want to win a few tournament games. That's the goal. They didn't hit their goal. And uh, can't count a successful season if you don't hit your goal. But there were certainly some special, special moments throughout this year. And uh, I don't think those should be lost sight of because of today or because of what happens tomorrow. Um, I appreciate you guys watching again. Going back to Georgia tonight, I uh, was going to stay tomorrow if Vanderbilt won, but now get to go home. So thank you guys for watching. God bless. And uh, thank you guys again. Really appreciate all the support this year from everybody. Peace.